Grace to you and peace to you from God our Father, the Holy Spirit, who brings us together in fellowship, and His Son, who has redeemed us. Amen. Today we come together and we honor our Father. Now each of you, you had a Father. And some of you, you may think of your Father in different ways. Some of you may think of your Father as the wonderful man, the kind, caring heart, the one you could always go to. Some of you may think of your Father as the one who was a little colder, that maybe you couldn't talk to him, maybe it was hard to speak to him, maybe, maybe it was hard to get advice from him. But regardless, oftentimes when we come together, we have a picture of an idealized father. Much like when we come together on Mother's Day. We have this idea of who we want our father to be. We have this idea of how we, want, uh, how we expect him. And even some of us who are in fathers, we try to model who we think that, how that perfect image of a father should be. Now, whether or not you think, whether or not you had a great father or a not so great father, we all find that we look above for the perfect father. And whether or not your father is still with you and you'll be celebrating today, or, or maybe later when you join him in eternity, we all do have in common that our heavenly Father has come to dwell among us. That our heavenly Father is perfect, and so as imperfect as our fathers have been at times. Our Heavenly Father has never been imperfect. And so as we do honor our fathers, we also, though, think about our God. And we think about the very nature of God. And not only the Father, but the whole Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we think about today as, although we don't have the pomp and circumstance that we have on Easter, or the pomp and circumstance of Christmas, Holy Trinity Sunday is an important day. It's a day when we discuss God and we discuss his nature. We discuss that mystery of the Trinity as much as we can as sinful human beings. And although we don't completely understand, we know that the, what God has given to us, that what he's given to us through his word. And we understand certain things about God and some things we do not understand. One of the important things we first have to start out with is, well, the Trinity is never, at least in name, found in Scripture. If you thumb through your Bible from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, you would never find that word Trinity in there. Whether you check the Greek, whether you check the Hebrew, even if you check the Latin Vulgate, you would never find in the Bible that word Trinity. But that's not to say that we shouldn't believe in the Trinity. That's not to say that we should join with some that believe there's only one Unitarian, that uh, only one nature of God. But instead we look and we see that countless times in Scripture we see the Trinity represented. We see those three parts of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we, because we see that, because it shapes us, and it helps us to understand who God is. Now, as we come together in worship, we always begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We close our worship. Throughout worship, we receive the forgiveness in that triune name. But more than that, the Trinity permeates our lives in other places. From the time of birth when we are baptized, we're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit because we receive that gift of forgiveness. And until we're, until we're on our, our deathbed and we commend someone to God, and then again, we, in the same way, commend them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into the Lord's hands. And so we see that the Trinity is often involved in our lives, whether, it's, whether we're thinking in worship or it's just our day-to-day -day life. Now, an important thing is, what is the Trinity? Perhaps as you've sat down before, you remember, oh, I remember in confirmation. We said the Trinity was three persons of God, one substance. Does that sound familiar? Something that maybe you said when you were, when you were going through confirmation? But what does that mean? What does it mean to say that there's three persons of God and one substance? I know as you look at it, we, we tried with the kids to explain it with water, and I've heard countless examples, but in truth, that is the mystery of God. And when we tried to explain exactly what that means about God, We've come into problems in the past. Remember at the beginning of the service, I mentioned that Nicene Creed and, of course, the Athanasian Creed? Well, that, those creeds were written because we had, we had problems where people didn't understand who the Trinity was. They thought, well, one explanation they thought was, well, maybe the Trinity is like math or scenes in a play. Act one, we have God the Father. He puts on the mask of creator. He creates the world. He sustains the world. He keeps it going. Act two. He takes that mask off. He puts on the mask of Redeemer. 
He comes into the world as Jesus, dies on the cross for us, and redeems us. Act 3. He takes off that mask, puts on the mask of Holy Spirit, and dwells with us. But you can see a slight problem with that, can't you? Because countless times, like I said, we see that God is not that way. It's not as though he's just three different pieces, three different times in life, but it's literally three persons. And when you think about three persons, we think about, although, well, we think about three different thoughts. Three, and now, you know, you might ask, well, would they argue together? Well, no, because they're in communion with one another. And this is an important thing, though, because when we look at the Trinity, when we try to understand the Trinity, the truth is, unless Scripture shows us, we can't divide up the works of the Trinity. You can't sit down and you can't say, aha, the Heavenly Father woke me up this morning and gave me life this morning. You can't say, aha, aha, I know, uh, the Son was the one who led me to repentance just now. See, at times we'll try to do that. We'll try to divide up and say, well, I know this or I know that. But in truth, when we see the Trinity work, He works for the better of His people together. And so unless we're given those divisions in Scripture, which at some points we are, well, then we don't know how the Trinity works. One important thing, though, is that's not to say that God the Father and the Son are two different people, two different substances. Because, And that's another distinction that was made in the past, is that the Father was God, and then He created the Spirit and created the, the, the Son. Well, that's not accurate either. And when we say, begotten of the Father before all worlds, we're not using the word begot in the sense of gave birth to, but understood that word begot as meaning that they are of one substance together. The Greek word that we use there is homoousios. You can hear that word homo is same, like. They are of the same substance They before creation. And we have this. If you read the creation account, especially if you read it with John chapter 1, you see that the word, Christ Jesus, was made flesh. The Spirit of the Lord hovered over the water. The Father created. And so when we look at the Trinity, we see them constantly acting together, constantly working in the people's lives, His people, the lives of those who don't believe even, leading us to repentance, to faith. So another, another question that's been asked before is, well, what about on the cross? Doesn't Jesus Himself say, Father, why have you forsaken me? Familiar with that? All of you have heard those words of the cro- from the cross. Well, what did Jesus mean there? If they are of one substance, how can they be divided? And that's a difficult question. Because on the one hand, you fall into a heresy of saying, well, the Father suffered along with the Son. And we can't say, and we can't say that because if we say that, then our, the Heavenly Father is imperfect, right? Suffering comes from imperfection. Suffering is a result of sin. But on the other hand, on the other hand, We also don't want to say that they were separated at the cross. And in truth, at the crucifixion, we do see all parts of the Trinity involved. The world didn't stop spinning. Life didn't come to a sudden halt. Christ's life did. But the Father and the Spirit were still involved. Still involved in the the creation. They had forsaken Christ because that was sin. And God is perfect. And And God cannot... Because he hates sin, come in to be with that sin. But Christ, he humbled himself, and not only was he begotten of the Father, but that next line, but he was born of the Virgin Mary. He took on that human flesh so that he could be like us and so that he could take on our sin. Now, whether or not we try to explain the Trinity with what little knowledge we have, whether or not we try to use big words like omniscient or omnipresent or omnipotent, we know that one truth remains about God. And that is that our God is a God of love. And that is that our God is one who cares for us. John makes a bold statement in in his first epistle. And I'll read a little bit more, but I want you to listen. I'm going to read to verse 12 of 1 John 4. And and I want you to listen closely to that last verse. But starting at verse 7. Dear friends, Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world, that we might live through him. 
This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Here's verse 12 now. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. And so we have that important aspect of God. One that focuses us in above all else. And that is that our God is a God of love. Whether we are speaking about the Spirit, whether we're speaking about the Father or the Son, God is a God of love. From the time of creation on, God has shown us this love. He created us to be in communion with Him. Just as He is in communion in the Godhead. We don't, we don't when they make decisions, we don't get a, a preview of that. But when they, they are come together in communion, and they have invited us in the creation to be part of that communion. In the same way, in the same way, God showed His love for us in the greatest act of love, in His death on the cross, when He took on our sins for us, when He paid the price for us. And the Spirit, Spirit continues to show us His love today as He walks among us, as He works in our hearts. But we want more. Oftentimes we want more. We don't want to settle with the fact that we believe in God that He is a Trinity by faith. We want to be able to give a list and say this is exactly what it means to believe in the Trinity, don't we? We want to be able to say we can parcel out and figure out exactly who God is. Don't you? Little kids do this all the time, don't they? They seek and they seek. They ask question after question, don't they? As they want to find out more. And we we don't lose that curiosity as we grow older. But the problem is, is as we ask those questions, well, part of the reason we do is because there's a small part of us that has a bit of a God complex. Now, just hear me out for a moment here. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, by their sinful pride, they sought to know as God knew. They sought to be like God. They sought to act like God, didn't they? And there's some of us that have our sinful human nature still that seeks after these things. We seek after being like God. We want to know exactly who God is because then, well, if we know who He is, we can be just like Him. But the problem is, is we cannot be God. We are sinful human beings. We have sinned and fallen short of His glory. We have sinned time and time again again, and failed to keep His law. And so even when we look at the world, we have a skewed perspective. We have an idea of what we would do. We have an idea of how we think God should run things. We think at times that we know better than Him. There was a movie that came out a few years ago now. Maybe it's almost ten years ago now. It was called Bruce Almighty. Some of you may have seen this movie. Jim Carrey pay, played the maiden character Bruce, who, took all, who, who was displeased with his life. He was displeased with the world and displeased with the way things were going. And so he challenged God. Now, of course, again, this is a fiction movie, so, and he said, God, I could do better than you. And so for a short time, he was able to play God. The problem with that is the same thing that would happen with us. The results were disastrous because we do have that skewed perspective that sinful perspective, no matter how we try to look at life and how we try so hard to be good and perfect, we cannot. And so we need, we need our perfect God, that Holy Trinity, to be the one who takes our place, to be the one, the one who gives us guidance and direction, the one who before we were ever born knew us, the one who knit us together in the womb, who saw us as his very own. The one who, as a good father, knew that we would need redemption for our sins and made that hard choice of sending his son. And Christ, who willingly came, that we might have salvation. We may not completely understand the Trinity. We may not completely know what it means to believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one substance. But we do know that our God is a God of love who has revealed to us Himself. We know that our God is one who has come and He has taken on our human nature, although we don't deserve it. He's taken on our sin. He's taken our place so that we could be with Him forever. 
And so as we look at, as we honor our fathers on Father's Day, as we honor the Trinity today, we give thanks for all that God has done for us, for all the ways that He has been in our lives, from the creation till our very, very last day. He is with us. He is the one who cares for us and loves us and will bring us home to Him. Now Jesus, in the last chapter of Matthew there, not only does He tell us about Himself, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, but He he gives us a command as well, doesn't He? Well, two commands, really. Go and make. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are not... We are not given this knowledge of God just so that we can keep it and keep it to ourselves. We're not given this knowledge of God just so that we can hold on to it and box it up inside of us. But we're given this knowledge so that we can go to the world and share that our God, the Holy Trinity, has come to us and that He has come to each person, willing to redeem them, willing to sacrifice them. That that act of the cross was redemption for all people of all times, of all places. And those who are believed and are baptized shall be saved. And so as we look to the Trinity, as we look to our baptism, we share that message of God's salvation. We share it not out of obligation, not out of requirement, but just as our God first loved us, so we love others and we share that good news message. We share that joyful news That although we don't know our God, that He is incomprehensible, that that He is eternal. We share that good news that He took on the form of a man to be with us. That He took on, that that He came to us each and every day, comes to us to lead us, guide us, and direct us. And so every day when you wake up, when you get up, or when you go to bed, Remember that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the one who has given you this life, who has redeemed you, and who will one day bring you to His side. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for creating us and creating this world, for giving us new life and for continuing to sustain life each day. We thank You for sending Your Son who has redeemed us, who has forgiven us, who gives, us, who gives us passage to your presence. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who dwells in our hearts and dwells in our lives. And that even when we were yet sinners, you came to be among us. Lord, help us. Help us to each day have the hope and assurance that because of you, we are forgiven. Because of your great love for us, we need not fear death. We need not fear all the things that happen in this life. But we can trust that we are yours, and that we will one day join you. Lord, until that time, give us the full assurance that we are your children, part of your family, that we may look to you as our Heavenly Father, who has seen as a good Father all that we need, all that we want, and has taken care of us. In Jesus' holy and precious name, who you have sent to redeem us, we pray. Amen.